fortunate at this university to have amazing talent, not only in our faculty, and our, both the Meritai and current faculty, but particularly in our students. Our students are doing phenomenal work, and we are really grateful to have this opportunity to congratulate them and to hear about the kind of work they're doing. So it has been traditional to have a plaque, which hangs usually in the hall, and we have now added the names of our two recipients, John Biersack and Michael Hemphill. This is the photo op. <laughs> John Biersack is a PhD candidate in the Department of Geography, and he will be giving his um, presentation of his essay on the politics of biometric passports in, in Ukraine. And Mike Hemphill is an undergraduate majoring in linguistics, linguistics and, and Russian, and he's going to be heading off to Kazakhstan this mm -hmm. summer. And uh, he has will be telling us about his presentation in a few minutes. Yes. And we have for each of you a certificate. <laughs> I hope you will notice we have a new crease stamp, Ooh. which is can be used not only on these certificates, but when you need letters to go present in places in Eastern Europe or Eurasia. <laughs> so the we have a pachat now. And notice that it is a round pachat, which is much superior to, let's say, a square or an oblong pachat. <laughs> and we also have for Mike a similar <laughs> certificate, also with the pachat. I think when you go to Almaty, we'll have to give you some official letters and identify who you are using the pitch That sounds awesome. Yes. <laughs> Wait, we have all three of you. Oh, and, of course. <laughs> and, okay, uh, there's more going on. <laughs> and, of course, in addition to the plaque, the certificate, and the occasion to share publicly their research, our two recipients will also be receiving a monetary award. I'm not quite sure how that works, but somebody here does. <laughs> so make sure that if you don't get it, you nudge us, because you definitely earned these awards. And so we will give them a round of applause. And now for the most rewarding part of this occasion, we get to hear the research. So John, you'll go first, and Mike, in a few minutes. Thank you, Eve, and uh, I want to thank you for the Betty Winner. Is she here today? She can't make it up the stairs. Okay. Betty, um, the elevator's broken, as I'm sure you've noticed. Mm -hmm. Betty said that she cannot make it up the stairs, but she will be joining the recipients for lunch afterwards. Okay. Okay. And um, I guess on a deeply personal note, I. Um, I'd like to, to dedicate this presentation to Alex, who yeah. um, had a, a long relationship with when he was with us. And so my presentation is on the politics of biometric passports, Ukrainian bodies at the borders of Europe. And how many people in here have an up-to-date American passport? Have you ever seen the symbol in the middle on the cover? Well, um, if you haven't, please look for it. It means there's a biometric chip in your passport, and um, it has been policy in the U.S. to have that for about the uh, past decade or so. And I'm not sure what's going. Uh, I became interested in this topic when I saw protesters in front of the Ukrainian parliament uh, in 2010, and they were still there in the same spot in 2012 in this little parking area with religious icons and signs saying no to biometric passports. And this sort of got me interested in the topic. Um, and I wanted to know what are biometric passports. And so to begin with, uh, biometric data is essentially physiological data that is measured from 
you via some form of scanner. Uh, it's typically a uh, fingerprint, an iris scan, um, a face scan, which is very similar to a picture, and uh, there are all sorts of other um, scan, uh, types of information in the pipelines, such as veins and brain activity, things of that nature. And uh, the data, this biometric data, is um, essentially a, bio, a biological measurement that is uh, stored on a chip in your passport uh, using radio frequency identification technology. Um, and it's generally in a uh, thick, shiny page on your passport. I believe it's um, a cover that you typically see scanned uh, when you have your passports um, going through a, like a border crossing. And essentially, there are machines that can read the information on the chip without um, coming into contact with the chip itself or the passport. So uh, this raises um, some issues about um, just how reliable this technology is, how it was adopted. A UN body um, in 2004, I believe, uh, decided that biometric passports with biometric chips using this contactless scanning technology would be the wave of the future for secure identity documents for air travel. And so, um, essentially, th this body and the biometric industry were pushing for this, and this was supposed to be um, the wave of the future and, uh, you know, sort of reflects a faith in technological rationality. And really, there, when this was adopted, there wasn't much empirical data to back this up besides it was high tech. And so, um, biometric technologies are um, problematic in a variety of ways. Uh, for example, um, they have difficulty reading people who are non-white or who have difficult to read physical characteristics. So what I mean by that is people with darker skin complexions, like it might be more difficult to um, get a facial scan that is readable uh, over and over again. So like your face gets scanned at a border crossing and it doesn't match what should be on the chip, what it says your face looks like, or the computer determines that um, this does not make sense. Or, so that essentially it calls into question uh, whether you are the person you say you are when you present your identity document. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, just another quick example, um, for whatever um, reason, biometric technologies also have problems um, with fingerprint scanning of people from Asia because apparently their ridges are slightly um, not as defined as other people around the world. And so scholars um, have been very critical of this technology, essentially saying it's um, essentializing people based on their physical measurements and assuming these are um, static, that our bodies are not changing over time. Uh, in addition, there are uh, concerns with how that data is stored, who's using and accessing the data that contains um, our uh, biometric measurements. And so um, with this development of this technology, there is sort of, um, there's this assumption that you equal what the data on your biometric passport um, says. And so this, if, if for some reason you can't be entered correctly into the system, um, kind of don't exist uh, regarding this technology. And, um, and with this shift to biometric passports, um, scholars call it kind of the, virtu the development of the virtual border and um, this idea that borders become mobile where the action is focused on the bodies that cross the borders rather than the static border lines themselves. And um, focusing in more on uh, Europe, the the uh, Schengen area is a zone that is encompassed in this blue here, and uh, it is an area where you can, get, once you get into, you can move between the countries there without uh, going through passport checks. Uh, the countries in this kind of greenish color um, are supposed to join the Schengen zone in the future, and of course, um, or I'm sorry, these are either sort of partnership states, and um, they. Essentially, the EU has a policy to um, develop closer relations with these six uh, countries, including Ukraine. And 
what I meant to reference is this is the Schengen zone right here, and these states in this greenish color are going to become part of the Schengen zone eventually when they meet European security standards. Um, and of course, Ukraine is right here next to several of those states. And so there's 26 states within the Schengen area. It came into effect in 1995. Um, it's been called um, the development of Fortress Europe, where you have a hardening of the external boundaries of the, Europe, of the Schengen zone. Um, and there are a variety of law enforcement agencies that um, police aspects of these borders. And there's a huge database system that um, tracks everyone uh, who tries to apply for visas to the EU or comes into the EU, who's um, deported from the EU, and it also includes measurements of their biometric data. And so, um, kind of moving into uh, the Ukrainian-Polish border, um, I always uh, like this picture from a Euro 2012 uh, soccer tournament uh, art project where to, to emphasize the friendliness of uh, the EU and Ukraine and Poland and Ukraine in this aspect, um, you know, they have these cross-border art projects. But in reality, um, the Schengen zone, which Ukraine borders several countries on, um, primarily Poland in western Ukraine, is um, the site of a vast amount, uh, complex of um, fences, um, cameras, x-ray devices, other types of scanners, uh, motion sensors that go miles um, into the European Union. Uh, it's essentially quite difficult to um, break into the Schengen zone legally. And so the, um, the biometric passport is in Ukraine an issue that um, is quite important both symbolically and practically in that uh, Approximately 500,000 to a million Ukrainians apply for short-term Schengen visas to enter the Schengen zone and work. Um, and there's an estimated 300,000 Ukrainians in Poland, um, whether legal or legal. And so um, easing Ukrainians' um, mobility into the European Union is a top priority for uh, the Ukrainian government. It has been for uh, over a decade. And so uh, there's this visa liberalization action plan where Ukraine has to um, adopt biometric passports as well as collect data on their citizens and reform their uh, own borders. Uh, and the EU has been, and including the United States, has been pumping a lot of uh, money into this uh, over the previous 25 years or so. Uh, and they actually have a huge program uh, to securitize the eastern border of Ukraine, uh, which is now going to be an issue for uh, the future uh, visa liberalization for Ukraine. And so um, I suggest that biometric passports are a um, political technology in Ukraine where it is a way of gaining influence and wealth within the state. So in 2012, um, there was a law put into place to uh, essentially develop a database of citizens and adopt biometric passports. And the parliamentary uh, member of Ukraine's uh, Verkhovna Rada who drove this law was um, the representative of the uh, factory, the publishing uh, corporation that was given the contract to make these biometric passports. And um, so was, there was quite a bit of protest at the time, which I'll show you a little bit. Of as well, and a lot of concerns over security. And so this sort of seemed to me to be um, Ukrainian politics as usual, unfortunately. And so uh, as well, at the time of, of this um, law in the end of 2012, uh, polls showed that about 60% of Ukrainians do not support uh, the creation of a state registry that um, includes biometric information and uh, the adoption of biometric passports. Um, this is essentially, I think, the only poll that um, specifically asked about this question. And so there was this great concern over what this meant. Um, there was a lot of doubt that the Ukrainian state could um, keep this data secure from criminals. 
um, because biometric technology, in addition to um, not necessarily being as accurate as um, we would like or uh, officials would like, it also is possible to forge it. Um, there are examples of uh, UK passports being forged as well as um, uh, a whole host of other um, examples of this. One of the most colorful, uh, which I'll add, is that uh, certain high-end cars require biometric fingerprint scans. Well, car thieves cut someone's finger off and use that to access someone's car to steal it. So I, I just want to um, emphasize that biometric technology is not foolproof. And, um, so there was a lot of protests in Ukraine. Um, these protests in this picture, they were protesting against the corporation that was originally awarded this contract. In the summer of 2013, uh, I have no idea why, but the Ukrainian state withdrew the contract after investing millions of dollars in this um, production corporation to make the passports. They essentially built them a, a lot of high-tech equipment to make these passports. They went back um, on the contract and gave it to the state publishing house, which made Ukrainian passports anyways. And so um, this uh, figure that you can see here basically says that it's already cost the state a million dollars the equivalent of a million dollars. And um, in addition, um, there were a lot of protests over biometric passports as a religious threat. Um, the sign of the Antichrist. Uh, now, I was reading up on this, um, and apparently, the, because the, the verb to implant is used in the law, like they implant the, ch the biometric chips into the passports. Um, a lot of people were interpreting that as somehow implanting chips in people. Mm -hmm. Somehow this was a sign of like the state controlling you, which was um, the chip represented the mark of the beast and was a sign of the Antichrist coming. So there was a lot of um, protests, particularly in um, southeastern Ukraine and Crimea. And it, was, it typically was run by um, groups associated with the Moscow Patriarchate of uh, uh, the Orthodox Church. And so as a result of all these protests, um, there was a, uh, they put an amendment to the law where you could opt out religiously. Um, I don't know how that's result going to resolve itself in the future because that totally contradicts what the EU calls for. There can be no exceptions to um, the state collecting biometric information. It has to apply to everyone. So that will be a um, thorn in the side of this for time to come. Uh, there also is a lot of, um, it seemed to me on the internet, a lot of resentment. And this is from an art exhibit of famous Ukrainians who were denied Schengen visas for various reasons. Um, the text which you can't read, it's their translation, but don't worry about it. It's just basically, it's like, why do we need visas? We're Europeans too. Um, and so we should have the right to travel into Europe freely. And so um, after Euromaidan, um, from, from essentially the Ukrainian government kept saying, oh, biometric passports are coming, you know, in the future, we'll implement them. I mean, there's a lot of um, monetary problems as well as political will with these protesters. And so uh, after the fall of the Yanukovych government, um, the Prime Minister at the time declared that biometric passports will be happening in 2014. Um, essentially, every time there's a major EU meeting, there is talk that maybe Ukraine will get a visa-free regime with the EU, and biometric passports are actually going to appear in Ukrainians' hands. Um, you can see from this picture, um, it's essentially after um, Euromaidan that they started processing at the uh, airport passport control, citizens of Ukraine and the EU together. It was the first time they started doing that to kind of symbolically demonstrate that you know Ukraine is part of the EU or will be at some point, or part of Europe at least. And so to kind of um, end, Ukraine actually began issuing biometric passports in January of 2015. Um, they've issued about 10,000, and they've kind of put a moratorium on it for the time being. Uh, I think because of production problems and probably financial problems with the ongoing conflict. Um, 
a visa-free regime for Ukraine continues to be deferred. Uh, the foreign minister of Ukraine has admitted that part, this is partially um, due to the situation in the Donbass, where Ukraine essentially um, has lost control of hundreds of kilometers of its border, and um, the EU uh, is very concerned about um, migrants and others coming in through that border uh, without being monitored, and so as a, as a means of hardening, keeping their border hard and secure, they, um, Ukraine, it seems, will be um, unable to get this visa-free regime for the time being. Uh, the, the technology of biometric passports, um, in one geographer's normal phrase, makes, essentially makes us walking, talking borders, where, um, again, the, the um, idea of crossing the border is now focused on the body, and that we match our chip information. And so I'll just end with the question of, you know, what are the implications of biometric passports for essentially embodying borders um, within a person? And I will end there. Thank you very much for your time. Generally, with these type of presentations, we ask that you kind of hold on to your questions uh, until we've had a chance to hear from both speakers. And then, so write them down. We'll get to them. I want to give Mike a chance to present as well. Mike, you can use my computer at all. I just need to be able to click through the slideshow. Should I do that from the You can do this around all the rest. Reconciliation of language and culture, and I just couldn't resist picking the life blue PowerPoint thing because, you know. Um, I just want to start off by saying that this is a very, very personal topic for me, and I chose it for very specific reasons, and I think that you'll understand those reasons by the time I get through. But this is the first time that I've really presented this in this kind of way, and so you'll kind of have to bear with me doing such a personal thing and such a, such a big presentation. So I have to start off with some bragging, because I'm me, and I love to brag. And my roommates can attest that winning the Laird Essay Contest made me just a little bit insufferable. <laughs> I, I'm a language person, and I love languages. And, I, and that's why I'm a linguistics and Russian major. I just, I've always had a bit of an aptitude for them. And like all high school students in the United States, I started off by studying Spanish in high school. And I do really, really well at it, if I do say so myself. I spent two weeks in Spain, and I have really good Spanish comprehension skills, even to this day, even though I haven't been working on my Spanish very much recently. And my Spanish was good enough in high school that my Spanish teacher, who was natively Italian, started to teach me Italian. And I did pretty well at that, too, not anywhere near my Spanish, of course. But I realized that going from Romance language to Romance language was really fun for me, and I really enjoyed the language aspect of it, but it just wasn't quite hard enough, I think. And so I chose something with a different alphabet, so it could be you know, confusing to lay people. And I chose something with some historical salience and you know, some international presence still, so I picked Russian. Which is great, because Russian does all kinds of things that are really, really linguistically salient. It's got consonant devoicing and case system, and the verbs of motion are terrible, terrible, terrible. But, <laughs> But they occupy me and they interest me, and so it's really fun for me to study Russian. So I really fell in love with this crazy language from Eurasia. And people draw some conclusions about you, I think, when you tell them that you're studying Russian. Like, ew, why? And like the communists, or I hear the Sochi hotels were terrible, because people don't really know that much about Russia, and they don't really know very much about Russian. So your choice of studying the language must be very telling about you, but in a way that you might not necessarily want to follow up. But I understood that people didn't really get why you study Russian, especially because a lot of people don't like linguistics, and linguistic concepts bore them, and after studying Spanish in high school, they just kind of dropped it off. 
So I kind of weathered the storm, and it was really worth it for me because I could speak some words in Russian, and people gave me funny looks, and I thought that was kind of funny. And then in the middle of my Russian education first year, we had the Ukraine crisis, and it hurt a little bit because people started to assume things about me based on the fact that I was studying Russian. And people began to think that I either was pro-Russian in the crisis, which I certainly wasn't, or they wanted to think that the reason that I was studying the language was so that I could bring Russia down in some way. And that definitely wasn't the conclusion that I wanted people to make about me because I liked the language and the culture interested me great, but the, the study of the language and the linguistic aspects of it were what really motivated me and I thought that the language was amazing and I definitely didn't want to pick sides and I definitely didn't want to have to think about the people who safeguarded this language that I love so much as having to take sides either. What do Russians think? was really a big question for me, because if it's fair for Putin to make the big statement that everyone else has to abide under, then Russian people don't really have a voice. And is it fair to think that what the nation does is what the people are thinking? Because I definitely don't want to be held accountable for every war that the United States has been involved in. So I decided to keep my answers pretty neutral. I gave people the facts when they asked, and I just kind of laid low. Because it wasn't fair to say, all Russians want Ukraine to be a part of Russia again, because that's, not, that's probably not even true. And then came the big lightning bolt, because I realized that I was gay. And Russians aren't so OK with that. <laughs> but. It was a really big problem for me personally, just being an American and living in the American culture, and I didn't want to move through my American issues and then also be working at the same time the Russian issues. So I let it be for a little while. I just kind of figured that I'd work through my identity at home first. And there is plenty to deal with in the United States with the gay issue. I mean, the whole community isn't okay with all of the parts of it, and there is some discrimination, we have problems with gay parenthood, we have making less money. I wrote a paper for my sociology class, and it really helped me delve into the issues that face the homosexual community, because that's not fair for gay people to be treated differently. And I was so engrossed in the American part of it, that when I found out about the Russian climate, it was really, really hard. I saw the documentary Hunted on YouTube, and it disgusted me a little bit. For anyone who's seen it, it's very, very graphic, and it's very, very powerful, but in a very disturbing kind of way. We have screenshots that demonstrate the way that people think about gay people in Russia, and it was really hard for me to take. By the way, this man is an Orthodox priest who is speaking for the church. But I don't serve the devil. I think that I'm probably worthy of living next to normal people in general. But then it draws right back to the Ukrainian crisis because it's not fair to think that all Russians inherently hate gay people and would inherently hunt them down in the streets, right? But at the same time, this is me. This is my identity. It's not some kind of geopolitical crisis that we're facing here that I'm never going to see and never going to be a part of. I'm not Ukrainian. None of my family is Ukrainian. I'm not Russian. None of my family is Russian. It's very easy for me to distance myself, especially since the United States is only nominally involved. But this, this was difficult. 16% of Russians say that it's acceptable. It's not even one in five. And I read an article that was discussing how Russians are not a devout people, but they um, tend to identify as Orthodox, as a part of the Russian identity. And the Orthodox Church goes right with Putin's propagandas that are against homosexuality. They say things like that man uh, from the screenshot where it's with the devil. That's not me. That's not fair. And in my Russian class, we even talked about the words for it, 
for getting married, that is. Genitsa and Vrita Zamuj. You can't even say gay marriage in Russian. You have to say that you're getting wifed or that you're leaving behind a man. Who's leaving behind whom? If it's lesbians, who's getting wifed? Because you can't really wife. It's, it's a mess, just from a cognitive linguistic standpoint. These people don't really even have a chance to get started with the idea of people of the same sex being together forever. And that's hard. <laughs> the Russian government <laughs> keeps making statements like how the YouTube propaganda, uh, the YouTube album cover is propaganda, and that's um, the album that was automatically put on all of the iPhones through Apple. And that's a man who is holding on to his son. It's a, the idea of the cover is that holding on to your own innocence is a lot harder than holding on to someone else's. And that's gay propaganda? Are we sure? This image is illegal in Russia because, it out, because Putin outlawed the portrayal of public figures in a way that was against their personality. This is a kind of suppression. This is ridiculous. He looks very pretty, by the way. <laughs> so I got interested in the idea of homophobia in Russia, and I decided to follow it through. Um, I started reading about Tsarist Russia and the way that they thought about homosexuality, which of course was not awesome because no one in that time period was very about homosexuality. Leo Tolstoy, of course, had a very firm moral code and he thought that homosexuality was involved with corruption and immorality. But at the same time, Tchaikovsky was himself a homosexual. So we have people who are unable to fully live their lives even way back then. And then in communist Russia, we got a little bit of an upswing. Lenin found that everyone deserves to be equal. He decriminalized homosexuality because he figured that everyone was an equal laborer under the state. Stalin associated homosexuals with pedophiles, which is generally more the opinion held today. And Khrushchev thought that it was mainly associated with prisoners raping each other. And that was his thought of homosexuality. So the last two in this list are, were very, um, very anti-gay in their own ways. But again, it's not me. I'm not a pedophile, and I'm definitely not a prisoner rapist. That's not fair to generalize that way. We saw a little bit of upswing. It's no longer criminal in... Russia to be gay, it's no longer considered a mental disorder, but tolerance is still going down all the time. And it's definitely something that we have to think about all the time. The new law that um, deals with propaganda especially targets teachers because the propaganda is, uh, the, the anti-propaganda is designed to spare children from being exposed to homosexual viewpoints. This is something against me in my own way. So is it fair to generalize? to say that all Russians are inherently homophobic and that their society is inherently homophobic because it's me, when the Ukrainians were probably dealing with something like this before. And the conclusion that I drew is just that it's going to have to be a case-by-case -case basis. Because even if there is only 16% of the population that is okay with this, with me, then that can be enough. And I just have to kind of weather the storm, I guess. The way that you change people's minds is slowly. And over that period of time, you expose them to the viewpoint. You let them know that I'm not a child molester and I'm not a rapist. And you take it from there. And so by that case-by-case -case basis, I plan on living my life. And if I succeed only despite my homosexuality instead of because of it, well, at least I succeeded. Thank you.